Well, all month long, in fact, this is the fifth week that we've been talking about messy things, and we've talked about how birth itself is messy, and babies are certainly messy, especially, oh my goodness, their diapers, which seem to be just millions of diapers. And then as they get a little older, learning to eat is messy, <laughs> learning to walk even is messy, and playing is messy, and it never ends because kids are messy, and oh my goodness, as we talked about last week, teenagers are messy, and I'm sure some of you all will... You know, all week long, all you could think is clean your room, clean your room, clean your room. Oh, my God, he talked about this, and we're still not cleaning our room. And so it's very messy. So it doesn't probably surprise you this morning if when, when you put all of those things together, um, <laughs> families are very, very, very messy. Uh, when you put all of sort of those things together and you put maturing together and hormones and growing up and menopause and midlife crisis and anger and all, all of the things that make up a fa- I, don't, I should have put something good in there and love and tenderness, but all, you know, all the things that, and resentment, all the things that make up family and you sort of put them together and make them share a bathroom. Oh my goodness, it is messy. And I think it's kind of funny that uh, my parents are here and Josiah's parents are here today. So, oh my goodness, do they have stories to tell. I'll tell a few today. I was raised in a about an 1800 square foot house at that time with two bathrooms, six brothers and sisters. There were nine of us. And so if you can imagine that got and one dinner table, very, very messy. In fact, I thought it was normal. I back, we went back home um, this, this summer, and I was talking to my brother. We thought it was normal that you got in the shower and just threw your clothes out, and three other people were in the bathroom. We actually thought that's how everyone did. We didn't even know till later that wasn't necessarily the way you had to do things. Um, but, but here's the thing I want to talk to you about families, no matter what your family's like, is that, number one, it's kind of strange because you didn't choose your family, right? You know, like, no matter, no matter what, some of you would like to, you know, even if you were adopted, you didn't choose your family, and you certainly didn't choose to be born to your family, and if we go a little deeper, you didn't choose to be born, like, in this area, or whatever, I'm from Missouri, or whatever area you were born, or whatever nationality you are, or whatever, like, country you're from, you didn't choose any of that. And so it's sort of easy to step back and go, yeah, I'm kind of stuck with those folks, my family. But, but I want you to think about something this morning before we go on. Like, you might not have chose your family, but I'm not sure they would have chosen you. I mean, look at this Craigslist ad for a roommate. I don't think babies would ever get picked if you had to choose your family, like put an ad out on roommate, you know, on roommates.com or I don't even know what that is. That might be something horrible. Scratch that on Craigslist (laughs) and and say, like, I'm looking for someone to room with. I have no money. Um, Incontinent. I'm going to need some diaper changing. No money to pay rent at all. In fact, you're going to need to feed me every two to three hours at first. And I need about an 18 to 35-year commitment before I'm actually out of it. You know, so, like, you would never, you just wouldn't pick that. But yet, the amazing thing about families um, is somehow, somehow, thanks to love and this sort of unseeable bond that happens, um, families are some of the greatest, most powerful things on the planet. And I would say they're good and messy, or good and messy. If you're from the South like I am, you'd say, that's good and messy. But like, they are good and messy, and so all of us have this experience, and maybe you go, well, you don't know my family. Let me take the mic for a while. No, we specifically ask that you not take the mic. But like, you might have a story about your family, uh, but let me say this. It's sort of interesting that universally, at least in America, um, we, it's one of the few things we agree on that family is important, at least. We might not be 100% on our family, or we might not be 100% on someone else's family as we check out their life on Facebook, but we would all sort of say, like, family is important. And in fact, most of us would say family is the most important thing. And I would say to you this morning that family is probably the most powerful thing and probably both the answer to our problems as a nation and the cause of our problems. Um, but it's messy, right? Like, so we can put that in, and and I have to say this, because uh, we live in a weird world, like, I'm going to tell you that I think families are great, and when I say family, because I was raised, I 
and trust me, I'm not saying this because I had a normal family. I did not. I just told you I had six brothers and sisters, and we all lived together in a place called, a, a land far away called Missouri, and we were not normal. But, but I would say, from scripture at least, that, you know, sort of like a dad doing his best to sort of hunter-gatherer lead, and a mom, you know, nurturing and loving and kind of binding up wounds. My mom was a registered nurse, and she was sort of of the military nursing branch, I believe. So we would, you know, if, like if you had, I've said this before, and mom knows this, like if you had an arm that had been pretty much gnawed off and was hanging by a strip of skin, you didn't tell her because she's like, we'll get some alcohol and we'll fix that, you know? So, so like, but if you have sort of a dad who's leading and gathering and, and protecting and trying to bring home lots and lots and lots of bacon and a mom nurturing and kids who sort of kind of obey, like, I think that's great. I do, and I think that's sort of the best case scenario, but that doesn't mean in America we kind of go, well, what about everybody else? Because that's not the normal family, and I know that, I know that. Um, so let me just say this morning, if that doesn't look like your family, I really am not beating up on you this morning. Like, I would say it this way, like, I'm a proud biped. Um, I feel like I have to explain that. That means I have two feet. Um, I just didn't want you to get any weird ideas like, Don admitted he's a biped. I knew it. But anyway, like, I, <laughs> I have two feet, and I buy my, sh my shoes in pairs, but that doesn't mean, and I know, like, if I said that on Facebook in America 2015, people go, yeah, but not everybody has two feet. And I would go, I know, I know, I know, and I love them. And I'm, but I'm just saying, like, I do, and most people do. And then someone would say, hey, there's a guy who only had one foot, and he's in the Olympics, and he's way faster than you. I'd go, I know, I know. So I know, like, we love to do that, and we say if we say something is good, we feel like it takes away from everyone else. It doesn't. So just let me say, I think the family is a great example of what God just, just intended this messy, loving relationship that is so powerful but yet is not perfect. Um, and that's important that we kind of gather that because we've been talking about this other thing that's a lot like family. Um, John 3.16, most of us have heard this, seen this, seen it spray painted on a bridge, heard it in a Keith Urban song, but it simply says that for this is how God loved the world. And he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Now, that verse is powerful, and that verse is so sort of clear-cut that we go, okay, if we believe, if we believe, then we will have eternal life, and it seems sort of like do this and then you will, but here's the thing about this verse. This was not like a tweet that Jesus put out. This is not sort of like a, a, a statement that he set out on his website, and we think in those terms, like this isn't a bumper sticker he printed up or a t-shirt. This was actually part of a conversation that he had with a guy named Nicodemus, and a guy named John wrote down this conversation, and the whole conversation started out with these words, like I tell you the truth, Jesus was saying to this guy named Nicodemus, who knew religion, who was practically a religious lawyer, but Jesus said to this man, he said, I tell you the truth, even though you're religious, even though you know all of these things, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God, which we still have that sort of terminology floating around, and it's still sort of uncomfortable, and we still sort of don't quite know what that means, but let's take Jesus at his words like, you're born once, as he said, of your parents. You're born into a family. And Jesus said, if you're going to be part of God's family, the kingdom of God, then you would also have to be born another way, born spiritually. And that's exactly what this guy named John, who wrote down the conversation, recorded the whole thing. Later on, when he was writing letters and trying to explain this very concept to others, he went exactly there. He said, you know, you got to be born again. And then he said, those who've been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So he said, not only are you born again, but you're born into something. Like, it's not just like you're born and then you go on to heaven. I mean, that doesn't happen, or <laughs> it would be really strange at baptism, because sort of like if we go, hey, yes, I'm a Christian, we put you under the water, and you'd never come out. Like, we've had that happen once, but that was my fault. I forgot they were down there, and then later on, but that's not, you know, like, you would disappear if the moment you became a follower of Jesus, if there wasn't more, and that's the more that we want to talk about. Now, over the past few weeks, and I want to catch you up, you're kind of coming in sort of the end of this movie, if you will, but we've been talking about inside of that thing, inside of that new life, inside of that family that we call church, um, there's this thing called grace. 
and grace is really messy. We spent a whole week talking about this, but let me, and when I do this later, I'm always like, but let me uh, sort of boil down my whole sermon that took like 40 minutes into a minute and a half, and you're wondering if you wasted your time two weeks ago. You're like, couldn't we have done that then? Yes, we probably could have, but I've got time to fill. Sorry. But grace, (laughs) this idea of grace, (coughs) excuse me, think of it sort of like a messy diaper, and I know that's a beautiful picture, but everyone in here, no matter how wise you are, no matter how put together you are, no matter how responsible you are, no matter how great you are, like, Somebody changed your diapers when you couldn't, and I'm feeling really uncomfortable because the two people who changed my diapers are sitting right over there, and now it's kind of awkward for all of us. But anyway, that's the truth, right? Like all of us, when we couldn't clean up our own messes, needed someone else, and then hopefully, like in my case, you know, it took almost 40 years, but then I went from being sort of a diaper mess maker to being a diaper mess changer, and so that's the process of grace. Like, God forgave us when we couldn't do anything for ourselves to clean up our mess, but then he asks us and sort of demands of us that, okay, so I did something that you couldn't possibly do when you were helpless, when you were still a sinner, and then we pass that on through forgiveness to others. We go, okay, I can forgive you because I was forgiven, not because I'm a great person, but because like everyone else, I've been forgiven. And so grace is really messy. I mean, imagine that. That has to mean that like all of us are making messes and and cleaning up messes. And it's not a beautiful picture, but I think it's a picture of grace. And then believing, we talked about this, like what we believe is messy. Like we go around a room even this small and like we don't believe the same things. We just don't. And there's part of that is like some of you are wrong and I'm right, but then that's not all of it. No, I'm joking. But (laughs) that's most of it. No, like, but it's some of it is not that you're wrong and I'm right. Some of it is that we get our beliefs a lot like we get our nutrition. Like when you're a baby, your parents feed you. Like, and most of your beliefs were fed to you by your family, by your parents, by your culture. And then over time, you start to feed yourself And then at some point you go, okay, I'm on my own enough. Like you go away to college or you get married or you you, you do something, you go to prison. I don't know what you did. But anyway, you go away and then you feed yourself. You choose what you're going to eat. And it's funny because you probably choose exactly opposite of what your parents chose. And then after a while you sort of come back to that. And that's just the way it works. But none of us agree exactly even with our parents. I mean, my mom would tell you, and she says I'm wrong. So that's just the way it is. But our beliefs are fed to us, and then eventually we start eating on our own. So we're all going to be in this room, and if we sort of went around the room and talked about our beliefs, it would get really messy because no one would agree exactly. And maybe because it's that part in your life where you're sort of going through that, or it may be just that you've come to a different conclusion than me. And so in everything, like growing up, maturing is messy. And, and, and that's another thing. Just like in a family, like there's never a point in a family. If you think about this, like God put together, I believe God created the family, put together a man and a woman who just shouldn't be allowed in the same room most times of the month. But like put a man and a woman, with, that's problems right there, with children of different ages. So like, you know, we, when we, in our wisdom, design classrooms or even church groups a lot of times, we always go, well, let's try to put people at the same age and the same place in life and sort of lots of affinity together as much as we can. And God and the family like, let's put together a baby, a teenager, a mom who's going through menopause and a dad who's just like entering his second childhood for somewhere. It's just doesn't work like you would you would not design it that way and God said no that's the way it should work because that's how we mature and how we grow we talked last week about how maturing is really like sort of a teenager with the messy room and you can yell at them and go clean up your room clean up your room clean up your room but they're really not grown up until their room is actually their room and that's a big difference that ownership thing happens and so that's happening in here and as I'll say last week I'll say again like we want that to be messy like the saddest thing I can imagine is like a place where we're all grown up together that means this church is dying so I hope there's like babies and people who are just sort of exploring faith and people who are living messy 
you know, just, just jacked up lives and they're here. But I also don't want everyone to be like that because it's going to be a lot of mess. There's not a lot of mess cleaners. But eventually we need to have also people who are growing out of that and sort of taking ownership of their faith and taking ownership of their Christian life and helping others instead of just needing to be helped. And so this process happens. And if we do it right, it's always going to be messy. Um, because there should always be, like even in a, in a family, even as the children grow up and the parents grow older, they never reach the same stage at the same, st- and you're gonna, somebody's going to go, oh, there are twins. I know, I know there are twins. None of my analogies really work if you break them apart, but if you want to do that, you won't like Action Church at all, but there's just all different stages, and so I would say churches are very, very messy, just like your family, and let's just be honest about that. Like, your family's messy, and my family's messy, and we probably have our, you know, we have our greatest moments that we think of, our greatest sort of joys in life, and, and it's so cool to have my parents here, and so cool to hang out with my brothers and sisters, and we talk about those greatest joys, but if we're honest with each other, you would probably say your greatest hurts came from your family, and sort of some of your, your biggest heartaches probably came from your family as well, so there's this messy thing, and there's this thing where we all sort of struggle with, and, and it's one thing in your family to go, well, I didn't choose my family, and they didn't choose me, but I was born there, and I needed someone to change my diaper, so I sort of hung out until I was at least 17 or 18, hopefully not for diaper changing, but you needed to be, you know what I'm saying, but like the thing about that is, is when it comes to churches, there's a part of us, as Josiah said in the opening, like we sort of think, well, I don't have to do this. (laughs) These aren't really my family, you know, like I I have family here, maybe, but all these people, like, when it gets messy, we have this tendency to go, well, why do I need this? You know, like, why should I really go to church? You know, I want to go to heaven, and I want to sort of receive that eternal life Jesus talked about, but this church is sort of a pain. Um, I feel like I'm channeling something. <laughs> it sounds like it feels a little like therapy there. No, but seriously, like, the, the messiness of interaction, the messiness of grace, the messiness of forgiving each other, the messiness of the fact that we're not all the same place in our beliefs, we're not all the same place in our lifestyle, it, it just sort of makes you wonder, like, why should I? And so I want to share with you just a few moments this morning, a, a, a few reasons why I think that you should think of that differently. I really, really do. And then we're going to celebrate messy communion, and I'll tell you why that's, that's important. So I want to read something. This is from Ephesians 4. And when I first start reading this, you're going to go, oh, I know why you like this passage, but it's not. So just hang with me. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 14, it's on your screen. It says, now these are the gifts Christ came to the, gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Might be my favorite verse. I'm a gift to the church. No, not really. Uh, But (laughs) it says, but here's the problem with that. Um, Their responsibility, if you just stop in verse 11, that makes me feel awesome. But there's verse 12, leaders, notice this. All of our leaders here at Action Church, we're not just gifts. We have a responsibility to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. So it's like a family, like people in leadership roles in the family, not only do they have authority, but they have responsibility, right, for how the family road runs to train up their children. Um, and this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature, as we talked about last week. It's not optional. It's not like, well, I can just stay here and be a baby the rest of my life and let everyone else take care of me. No, that's not normal in life, and it's not normal in the church because it says we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ, and isn't that sort of hard to handle? Like, it would be tough if I said, hey, you know, no, actually, it wouldn't be tough if I said, hey, you know, you need to, you need to sort of ri- raise up to the standard of our leaders, you know, be like Bill, or be like Matt, or be like me, or be, but no, 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 be like Denise, that would be a tough one, you know, she's actually the good one, you know, or Michelle, oh my goodness, you, but like, that's not the standard, that would be hard, but it said we would rise to the standard of Jesus Christ, and I love Jennifer Allen, she's like, what about me, that's horrible, I shouldn't talk. Uh, But it says, then we'll no longer be immature like children, and we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. It won't be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound. See, see, here's the thing about church. Um, When you're a newborn baby, there's never been a point in history, let's say this, um, as much as all of us go, oh, there's got to be a better way sometimes than to have a family because it's a mess. 
But if you think about it, of the thousands of years that we've been on this planet that we can even record, um, there's never been a time when the family wasn't sort of the best way to handle growth and maturity and nurturing and training. I mean, there are places in Africa where due to AIDS and war, there are just, I mean, more orphans than there are parents. And there are actually, it's so sad to see, I saw a documentary where it was nothing but children sort of raising children because their parents were, and, and, and it's one of the saddest things that breaks your heart and makes you want, I'm glad we sponsor children and all those things, but it does, at no point do you watch that documentary and go, wow, all the parents are gone, everything's great because parents were the problem. I mean, it just doesn't happen. And other countries, like in the, the Soviet bloc, especially Eastern Europe at different times, they would have sort of a, a, a thought that maybe we could put people in orphanages and like it was more efficient for the parents all to work and we'll take care of your kids most of the time. And they sort of put kids in cribs and never touch them. Or they, would, they would actually you know, teach them but not love them. And the kids were scarred horribly. I mean, at no point have we found another system, even as inefficient and messy and sort of screwed up as families are, we've never found a better system because I think God designed that. That's what he's saying here. He's like, for you to mature, you need to be in the church, and there need to be leaders that are responsible for your growth, and there need to be babies who are growing up. And he said, there's going to be people that are going to try to lie to you. And you're going to need to somehow, like, listen to your leaders enough not to be fooled. And isn't that true in life? Like, if you've got teenagers or even, like, tweenagers or even younger, like, one of your biggest responsibilities as parents is to kind of guide them and go, no, don't believe that, honey. Don't believe that, son. That's, that, you know, I know all your friends are getting that Drake tattoo on their forehead. But trust me, that's not, you know, like, at some point, you know. And I know, honey, he is out of prison and he's 33 and he married but a nice guy but I don't think he's the right guy for you at 11 you know it's like these are things that we have to teach our kids but it's because they're being sort of preyed on it and fooled and, and sort of given wrong advice and wrong information and I was thinking about that this morning and I just want to say that to you I know we have kids in here and and teenagers um here's the thing and, and parents aren't going to listen I'm just going to tell you something I know your parents are dumb because my parents were, they're here, but they're not listening. So don't listen, mom and dad. But like in the 80s when I was a teenager, my parents were dumb. Oh my goodness, they were dumb. I was like, I know so much more than them and they didn't know anything. But here's the weird thing, and I don't know how this happens, guys, and so I just want to help you out because you don't know this. Over the next like 20 years, they take a class or like, I don't know what happened, but they're so much smarter. It's weird. Like now I'm like, eh, pretty brilliant. And, and, and I know like they've learned all those things like to be more like me, you know, <laughs> and it's like, so I just want to tell you, like, I know your parents are dumb and they, they don't understand and your friends are smarter and like you, you get better advice on the internet every day of the week, but, but, but just, just humor them and act like they're smart and then it won't be awkward later when they catch up with you. Okay. And they're going to catch up with you approximately when you start raising kids and paying taxes. So they're going to get smarter. So here, here's the thing. I just want you to know that, and that's what this is about. This is about, like, there are times in our life that we think we know best, and I'm going to give mom and dad their thing they've been waiting for for, like, 47 years. You were right. I was wrong. See? It took me 47 years, but you're right. That hair was dumb. I'll finally say it. You know, I had, like, this giant permanent, and they're like, that looks ridiculous. Like, even on share, that looks ridiculous. I'm like, no, this is awesome. You know, so anyway, like you were right. I was, but that's the thing. That's the thing. Um, and then it says these words, and I want to kind of leave you with these words in this talk about church. It says, instead, we'll speak the truth in love, growing every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body. So you're not trying to grow like me or grow like our leadership or grow like the more mature people. Like, we'll let you down. And we don't want to, and we want to set good examples, and we want to be men and women of God, but that's not the standard. The standard is Christ, and he's the head of the body, and he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. And as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and it's growing and full of love. See, here's what I want to tell you this morning. I just say all that to say this. Don't go, stop going to church. I really, like, I know it's bad to say you're here this morning. After this, stop going to church. And here's why, because it's just not enough. I want you to belong to a church family. See, that's a very, very different thing. 
And I know some of you are doing that this morning. Some of you are belong, and I know some of you are visiting, and you're like, hey, I'm just, and that's cool. And if you're visiting, this is sort of the best and worst of church. Because on, on one hand, it's like you're visiting someone else's house, or even if you're just checking out Action Church, and we're going to be hospitable and nice to you. Like when you go over to your friend's house, isn't it funny as a kid, you always go, their, their family's so much nicer than mine. But the truth is they were just being nice because you were there, and that's the way we are as a church. Like, we're a mess, but we're going to be hospitable to you. But the truth is what you really need is to be part of your own family, and this could be that if it's the right place for you. And then we have that thing of like, I love that thing that he said, like speaking the truth in love. I mean, that's what family does, right? Like they go, that's, I love you, son, but that's ridiculous. That's the best thing that you could actually have. Or, hey, I love you, sister, but don't wear that. Like, seriously, I know, I know, I know. But I love you, sister, but no, no, no. He's not right. That's what we need, and that's what will cause us to grow up, and that's what will protect us. Um, and so that's what I want to do. And we're going we're gonna to pray very quickly, and we're going to have messy communion and not for any special reason other than we still don't know how to do this. I asked Mitch, I'm like, you're from a real church. How do you do communion? And we still don't have it right. But we're going to try this again. But this is sort of our family dinner. And, and it's not magic. <laughs> and if you're here today and you're not a believer, because what we're going to do is we're going to celebrate that Jesus is our Savior. We're going to celebrate that we are born again into that family. And so if that's not you, like we're going to keep it kind of dark in here and you're not even going to like feel bad if you just hang out in your seat. But if you're feeling like this morning, like, yes, I am born again, and I am looking for that church family, or I am visiting, and I want to be part of that and sort of celebrate Jesus, this is exactly the place, and I want to tell you one other thing, which I think is funny, because I've read the instructions for communion that Paul gave in Corinthians, like, so many times, and I've sort of pulled them out, and I'm going to do that this morning. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to absolutely show you what those instructions are. And they're really sort of amazing and neat. And, and <laughs> but I want to read to you just a few verses beforehand so you can see that it's not just our church that is messy. It's all churches. Um, because right before he gives those instructions that we're going to use today, he says this. He says, but in the following areas, I can't praise you. For it sounds like more harm is than good is done when you meet together. Imagine that. He said, first, I hear there are divisions among you. You're fighting, kids. You're fighting. Um, <laughs> and to some extent, I believe it, but of course, there must be divisions among you so that you will have God's approval will be recognized. He's saying the reason why there's divisions is some of you are wrong. I mean, some of you are sinful and some of you are sinning. Um, probably all of them are sinning, truthfully. It says, when you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing to others, and as a result, some of them go hungry while others get drunk. What? Don't you have your own home? See, imagine like it's amazing, like, they brought their own stuff for communion, and they were actually like, well, I bought a 12 e pan. I'm all right. You know, like, somebody's getting drunk, and someone's hungry, and someone's left, and they weren't even sharing their food, which that's number one rule at the dinner table, right, Mom and Dad? Isn't it amazing, like, how messed up they were? But in spite of that, we have this. It says, for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Here's what I want us to do. I'm going to pray. And if you've been born again in that way, if you're a follower of Jesus now and you want to celebrate that with us, you are welcome at our table. And for some of us, some of us, that's all it's going to be. Like you're visiting or you're still checking this place, and that's okay. You're welcome at our table. And if you go, that's not me, just stay in your chair. You won't even feel bad. It, it'll be, you know, you won't feel weird at all. Just, just stay there. But it could be more. Like, it could be more. This could be the day you go, I'm tired of going to church. I'm tired of visiting churches. I'm tired of occasionally going and go, well, the message was okay, but it didn't change. You know what? Changing my messages will never change you. And guess what? As great as the other pastors are in town, their messages won't change you either. It's the family. It's the people speaking truth into your life and love that will change you. And that's what we want to invite you into. Um, 
And so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to just sort of slip out into the center aisle if you'd like to, and we're going to come straight up here, and then we're going to try going <laughs> to your right and kind of going out that way, and you'll just take a cup and take the bread, and I'm not going to have a special time when I ask you to eat it. Just, just serve each other, and you're welcome to take the cup and drink it and eat the bread as you kind of move through, and then we'll gather back here for a few final words. And so let me pray with you. Dear Jesus, um, this place is because of you. Um, and God, I'm thankful for those of us who have experienced that new life, that new birth in you. And God, it's a messy thing that we do, this family idea, this church idea. And God, I pray for everyone here this morning who is sort of like struggling with that. And they're not sure, God, I, I hope that we are hospitable and make them feel welcome. But I, God, I just pray that they would deal with that. And they would sort of make a call on that and sort of begin to dig down and go, is that true? And should I be? And God, we pray that this would be a messy place forever. God, never get cleaned up, never get where everybody's at the same stage, never get where we have good people who never sin. God, let us be a messy people who sin often and forgive even more. God, we love you. So we praise you and we ask you to be part of this, this messy communion that we celebrate today. It's in your name we pray, amen. Let's all stand up. If you'd like to be part of this, sort of make your way down here to the center aisle.